How many of you have ever done a yarn bowl? Have you done more than one? No. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, I, I ask because most of the time when people do a yarn bowl, uh, they swear off after the first one because they have trouble doing this, the, what's called the J slot uh, for the, you know, the yarn slot. And a lot of people, you know, will find ways to do them like with coping saws and so forth. Um, the way that I got into doing yarn bowls uh, I never intended to do them, but you know, my wife went to a yarn shop one day and she came home and showed me a picture on her cell phone and she said, do you think you could do one of these? Yeah, sure, no problem. And so I went ahead and turned a bowl and then I'm trying to figure out how to do this slot. So I started drilling holes and trying to, you know, do it with the coping saw and stuff. I, the bottom line is I made a mess out of the inside of the bowl. And the inside, the outside of the bowl is pretty easy to, to finesse that, you know, you, you know, clean it up pretty easy with sanding and, and, a, and a, a rasp. But the inside was a bear to do. So after uh, three or four attempts, when they, they all went into the, the, the burn pit, uh, because I wasn't happy with any of them, after three or four attempts, I started looking around for another way to do it. And about that time, the uh, AAW Journal the American woodturner came out with an article on how to do the J slot. And what the guy did is he had built a jig. And this is a kind of a copy or my, my version of his jig. Uh, the bowl mounts in here and there's a template on top. And the, the template is, it takes a little while to make the template, but uh, uh, you do the template and then use a router uh, to route out the inside of it. Uh, to route your J pattern, and also uh, I, I put a couple of holes in for uh, needle storage in the thing. And I made mine adjustable so that depending on the, the depth of the bowl, you know, the, the, uh, that I'd be able to move it up and down and position this about where I want it, because I think in general you want the J slot at about the center of the bowl, the, the bottom of the J slot. So I, I did a, a, a couple of pieces that way, and I still hit because I was using a, you know, just a straight router bit, a quarter inch straight router bit. And I had the same problem that I had when I was drilling holes and trying to cut them with coping saw and, and stuff like that. I was tearing up the inside of the, uh, of, of the bowl. And then it dawned on me that I should be using a spiral upcut bit. And a spiral upcut bit, they're, they're a little pricier than a standard bit. But what a spiral upcut bit does is as you go down into the material, it pulls the waste material up and ejects it through the flutes out the top of the bit up towards the router motor. And when you get down to the bottom of, you know, to the opposite side of your piece, you have little if any tear out. And any tear out that you do get with it uh, is pretty easy to address, you know, just with uh, a little sandpaper and a little, you know, little quick sanding and maybe a, a little work with a rasp to clean up, you know, the, uh, the interior of it. So what I brought today is uh, a, a blank. And this is, uh, uh, if it turns out, if I'm successful with it, this will be bowl number 64 for me. Uh, I had done 63 of them. And of the 63, 60 were sold. Uh, so I've got a couple in inventory yet. Uh, I was selling them through a shop in Sturgeon Bay and also a shop on University at, you know, here in Green Bay. And um, you know, the bottom line is those shops went out of business. And I found uh, three of my bulls were still in inventory at one of the shops, so I was able to pull them back. They'd been on consignment there. But uh, this is one that I, I, I prepared. This is pine. I normally don't turn a, a bull out of pine. But uh, I thought, you know, for demonstration purposes, if I ruin it, it's not a lot of good wood gone, right? So the, the bowl inserts into the jig and tighten it down. And by the way, I, you'll notice that the, the, this bowl is still on the face plate. Uh, for most of the bowls that I do, both yarn bowls and, and, and other segmented bowls, as well as um, uh, uh, what I call chunk bowls uh, that are done out of a solid piece of wood, um, I leave them on the faceplate 
uh, until I'm ready to finish them. It's a lot easier to finish these things when they're still able to be attached to the lathe than it is to have a loose bowl uh, that's sitting on the, on the uh, workbench. Okay, um, this is a, I, I use a DeWalt plunge router. Uh, any router uh, will work. Um, I prefer the DeWalt and Porter Cable uh, routers with the uh, Porter Cable uh, bushings in the bottom. The guide bushings are actually what run in the track uh, on, the, uh, on the jig. And uh, the router bit extends through. I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not because I've got it set fairly low. But I just extended the router bit down, so I'm only going to take off about an inch, about an eighth of an inch. And it's much better to take several small cuts than it is to try to take one big cut. With a quarter inch bit, uh, you, you can get a lot of chatter, which gives you a really rough surface inside uh, your cutting area. And you also run the risk of, of breaking the bit. And these bits are uh, spiral upcut bits run about 35 or 40 bucks. Uh, and if you're lucky, you'll find one at um, uh, uh, Home Depot or uh, Menards, but I wouldn't bank on it. Uh, I've been buying them from Woodcraft, and uh, Woodcraft sells a, uh, uh, the brand of bit that they sell is Whiteside. And Whiteside is a, a very high quality American made bit, and I prefer the Whiteside bits because they seem to stay sharper and perform better. And the router gets a little bit noisy and a little bit dusty, so here we go. Okay, I'm only part way through here, but uh, I wanted to show you uh, the progress so far. And the one disadvantage that I have right now is that I, I don't have this clamp down to the lathe. Ordinarily, I'd clamp the jig down to the workbench and it'd be a lot steadier surface to work on. It is a little bit rocky here, but I think we can make do with it.
and there it is. Um, I got a little tear out on the inside. Um, there's a little fuzz in there, but it will clean up pretty easy. And I think my bit's getting a little bit dull, but I'm going to pass this around and let's take a look at it. Jerry, a couple of questions? Yes. Do you put a lip on the top of your bowl? Usually, yeah. Um, not not real big. If you the if the curvature of the bowl uh, dictates the width of the lip, of course. And this is probably what a quarter of an inch or so, maybe a little bit more. Uh, this one I didn't put a lip on. Uh, it it just depends on how you feel. And the truth of the matter is, these were both done from the same uh, the same design or the, you know the, the same setup on on the uh, um, uh, uh, segmenting sled. So the segments were all cut the same length. The rings were all the same size. It just I, I, I cut the rings wide enough so that I have a little bit of uh, a little bit of latitude in how I, I shape the bowl. I, I you know this is okay, but I, I really don't care for this bowl as much as I like the shape of that one. There's something about the shape of that one that to me is just more appealing. Yeah. 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 But I'm going to have to come up with a better shape. I like where the shape is. Yeah. Yeah. This, um, I, I, the, the shape of the bowl, by the way, you know, you can buy yarn bowls or you know, people make yarn bowls in whatever size you want. They, you know, a lot of the ones that you see advertised uh, uh, that, you know, that you can buy, somebody was advertising them on Facebook a couple of years ago. And, you know, my wife looked at those and she said, well, she said, those look about like yours. And I said, well, you know, they were 35 bucks plus $15 shipping, but, you know, still under $50. So she bought one. And the thing's the size of a coffee cup. I don't know, you know, I, I suppose if you're using a real lightweight yarn, you might be able to get, you know, but for the size, I kind of settled on a, a bowl that's about six inches tall and about six and a half or so internally inside. So outside, it's going to be usually around seven inches. Um, I cheat on the basis. I don't want anybody to tell anybody this. This is all just between us, okay? This is not a solid wood base. It's plywood. Yeah, 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 yeah. What what I do? You know, the first couple of ones that I made, uh, I used a solid wood base in them, and I thought it looked pretty cool, you know. And then I started thinking about you know wood expansion and contraction, and you know wood moves with humidity and stuff. And then I got to thinking, oh, wait a minute, one of those that was sold, I know who bought it. I know she goes to Arizona every winter. I know that she also takes her yarn or knitting stuff with her to Arizona. What's going to happen when she gets, you know, goes from Wisconsin in November, where humidities are still fairly high, down to, you know, 8% humidity in Arizona in the wintertime? Is that going to crack? Well, as far as I know, it hasn't cracked yet. But I took that as a clue that I ought to do something to avoid the danger of having that come back because, you know, I don't want to sell somebody one of these things and have them walk up to me at a craft show when I'm trying to sell one to somebody else and say, hey, your bowl cracked on me. So the easiest thing to do is to put a floating base in them. And if you're doing a floating base, you don't really care what the wood is as long as you have some veneer uh, that you can use to cover it with. So thanks to Kevin Carpenter, I have a lifetime supply of veneer uh, and a couple of, of colors that just happen to match the colors that I use uh, in, in, in the woods in the yarn bowl. Uh, this one that we're passing around now, I, I, I believe it has a floating base in it too. I think I put a floating base in it. Uh, but I, I like the floating base concept because it really reduces the uh, uh, possibility of cracking. And it's also a lot cheaper to build in terms of your material cost. You know, plywood is very inexpensive, and and when the veneer was free, you know, no problem. Jerry? Yeah. You're about six bowls ahead of me. <laughs> uh, I have my tester and my wife tell me, make sure you get all of the fuzz and everything off of that uh, roof because yarn is fuzzy. <coughs> and it's on it. And yes, it'll slide through, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't bring it with me today, but I, I, I made a couple of them. I have uh, round sanding sticks that I attach uh, a Velcro based uh, sandpaper uh, uh, abernet to. And I polish these down to 800 grit uh, on, on the inside. And yeah, it, it is critical because if there's anything that's going to catch on them, uh, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of having the bowl, really. You know, stuff, your, your yarn ball doesn't roll around on you, but you can damage the yarn depending on the type of yarn you're using. <laughs> Anybody else? Any questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I, well, actually, um, for the, for, for, uh, for, for oh, uh, oh, okay, uh, when I do a, uh, use a faceplate, I attach a glue block to the faceplate, so what you're seeing here, is faceplate, glue box, and this first row of, of segments actually has the 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 the, uh, the the bottom in it. And if you if you were to peek in the, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of peculiar, I guess. A lot of people don't do this, but you know it seems to work for me. When I put a glue block on a faceplate, I drill a hole all the way through. And the hole matches, the, uh, in most cases, will match the size of the spindle. This one a, is a one-inch hole. But the reason I do that is that it eliminates the possibility of me putting too much glue uh, on the face, on, on the glue block. Uh, and it also gives me the ability to look in and see what the bottom looks like. And if, if, I, forget to, if I forget to put a center marker in, uh, that gives me a chance to drop a, uh, a, a, a little uh, tool that I have into the faceplate, tap it with a hammer, and it puts a center mark in, you know, on, on the bottom. Now, with a floating base, I don't need to do that. I already know where it is. But this, the, the base on this is, is pre-sanded, and it's actually signed already. If you, if you take a look in it, you, you can't see it on camera, but if you take a look in there, you'll see that it has my brand. And probably, yeah, it has number 64 uh, already in it. So, um, I, yeah, well, yeah, what I'll usually do is I'll put it uh, on a, a set of cold jaws and, uh, and, and finish it that way. There's really not much finishing that needs to be done on it because before I assemble, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, glue block to the, uh, to the first ring, uh, the, the, the base is already sanded. And in, in some instances, if I'm not going to do any dyeing or coloring or anything like that, I'll even pre-finish it with shellac. And the reason for doing the, the uh, shellac uh, on the floating base, it reduces the possibility that uh, it, it glue is going to stick to it. Because you want that floating base to be able to move. Not much, but you want a, a little movement possible. So I, I, I will, in some cases, pre-finish them with a shellac. This one I didn't pre-finish because, you know, it's it's pine, and I don't know for sure what I'm going to do with this. I'll probably put it up for sale in the craft show uh, out at uh, Denmark this October. So how are you removing the space plate out there? Oh, put it back on the lathe. So you turn it all off yeah, yeah, it yeah. Just you know, just do a a, a, a thin parting tool, okay. and parting. yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll, you see a lot of people when they uh, when they're gluing a glue block to a to a workpiece that they're going to turn they'll slather it all up with glue put glue on everything i don't i put a narrow strip of glue around the edge and i don't glue the center two reasons for doing that first of all there's really no holding power that you're going to derive anything to your advantage by putting glue all the way across that 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 glue block or the or the, the bottom of your piece and the other thing that it does for you, it tells you how far you have to go in with the parting tool before it comes off. 
there's not much mystery to it. If you put in, you know, a half inch wide uh, 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 glue, you know that you're not going to be able to have to go more than a half inch. And it makes it a lot easier to predict when it's going to come off, uh, when it's going to come off the face plate and, you, you know, you can catch it that way. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, to me, it's, it's never made a lot of sense to, you know, to, to you know, to, to put all that glue in there. Uh, because in most cases, depending on how long it sits, in most cases, the the the, the center of that glue, uh, that glue block, isn't going to cure anyway. That's how why you know you see occasionally you, if you watch somebody on YouTube when they're they're parting off a uh, uh, a glue block from a, a, a workpiece, they'll come up with the, you know uh, sticky stuff, sticky sawdust, on the end of their parting tool. Well, that's because the glue inside hasn't cured yet. You know the glue outside will cure, but you know uh, the curing process with uh, uh, PV, uh, PVA based glues, uh, which is all the tight bond glues, the curing process is really an evaporative process. Uh, tight bond is a uh, uh, it, it, it's a solvent based glue, and the solvent for tight bond glue is water, and as as the as the as it evaporates as it as it cures you know that uh the water uh, uh migrates out and that's where you get your curing process that's where the bond actually takes place well if you've got all that glue in there and air can't get to it you know because what causes water to evaporate air uh so I, it never made much sense to me to put a whole lot of glue into them i've never had one fly off either you know i you know, I, I mentioned that to somebody some time back, and they said, well, aren't you afraid that it's going to fly off the lathe? No. I, I'm much more concerned about something that I put into a chuck flying off the lathe than I am using the faceplate. And I'm, I'm not quite to the extent of, use, of, uh, of using faceplates as somebody like Lyle Jameson is, but I use faceplates a lot more, and I never use a chuck on segmented pieces. I always use faceplates. Pardon? Uh, oh, I never used uh, chucks on segmented pieces. Uh, I always used face plates. Well, another advantage to it is, and I didn't don't do it on these. You know, these I'll I'll put the whole uh, assemble the whole stack of, of rings, and this is only eight rings. Uh, so it's not it's not real deep there. It's not a lot of stuff in lot, not a lot of, of wood in this. But if I were going deeper, if I were building a vase or something like that, one of the advantages in using face plates, you, know, you could do it with a chuck too, but it's a little more complicated. Using face plates is you can do as many segments as you want. Like some of the the, the little bases that I've done, those are done in two or three segments. That I'll then you know once I get them turned inside. And, and get them down to a size that's manageable, and then I'll glue, the, you know, glue them together. It's a lot easier to finish the inside that way. I, I do a lot of that, by the way, finishing the inside on the segment of things to fool Al Conard, because uh, he's got fingers that are about this long. He can get down inside the thing, and if I if I if I get if I get it smooth, you know, nice and smooth, I, I know how long how far Al can reach into a vase. If I get it nice and smooth and finish down to there. Then he can never tell what I did. Yeah. Yeah, you got to be careful about that. Uh, it it works, but not all hot melt glue is the same. Uh, if you use the craft store stuff, uh, you got a pretty good chance that it's going to come loose on you. There's a, there are hot melt glues that are designed specifically for 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 wood turning or for for woodworking processes, and that stuff works okay. But you know, no matter wh what kind of uh, hot melt glue you're using, even the craft store stuff, you got to make sure that your gun is capable of getting it really really hot. And I don't know what the temperature is on mine because I've never really looked. But I bought a fairly expensive hot hot melt glue gun. And I crank the temperature up all the way. And, you know, you can actually burn yourself pretty good if you touch that glue too soon after it comes out of the nozzle. But, you know, I've, I've not had problems with it. But, you know, again, I'm using a pretty high quality glue. 
Uh, there's a, uh, a wood turner that I watch uh, somewhat, uh, it was a Canadian wood turner uh, that uses hot melt glue, but he doesn't use a glue gun. He uses a frying pan. He's got an electric frying pan that he fires up. He throws the hot melt glue uh, sticks into that and melts them and plunk, dips the whole thing in it and then sticks it on the lathe. And it takes a while for it for it to cool down enough to bond, I'm, I'm sure, but he, he claims that he has never had a problem with it. And I, I can understand why, because he's probably got the temperature on that frying pan up to what, 350, 400 degrees? Well, you know, I don't know what they'll go to, but that gets the glue to the point that it's almost boiling. It's a Yep. Yeah. 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 Pete? Yeah. Yeah, that works pretty good too. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I have a little trouble getting the bags though anymore. It, 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 the, the ones that work the best are the uh, brown grocery bags. My wife converted to plastic some time ago. So, but every once in a while, I'll pick up uh, a, you know, a, a pack of, of brown bags. And I, I've, I've used that some, but you know, I, I uh, you know, just gotten to the point that it, you know, it, it's, it's. By the way, I I never turn one. Uh, um, if I if I'm going to do uh, yarn bowls or something like that, I'll do them in multiples of two or four. Uh, and the reason for that is, well, first of all, I'm, I'm I'm fortunate in that I have two lathes, so I can you know go back and forth between the lathes. And if I'm doing two or four at a time, it's a lot less setting up on the saw uh, for the cuts that I need to make. I'm setting up the tools once, and I get you know two or four uh, products out of it. And the other thing is that you'll see a lot of people that are doing uh, segmented work that are using a, a like a veneer press, you know, where they crank down on it and it's got, you know, a platter and so forth. Uh, I built one of those and I don't like it and I don't use it. Uh, this is a 700 pound clamp and I do all of my assembly for my segmented pieces uh, on the lathe itself. It's a lot easier to get it to run, to, to get everything centered and running concentric if you're using you know, the, the lathe, as opposed to trying to do it on a press. I've never, I've never seen a press yet that really does what I think is, is uh, a, a job that competes with building them on the lathe. Uh, 